Yes, please. Okay, so this is Chris Tong. He's a doctoral candidate in Complet at the University of California, Davis. His publications have appeared or are forthcoming in Chinese Eco Cinema, Chinese Woman Cinema, Literary History of Taiwan, and Metamorphosis, a Journal of Literary Translation. He received his bachelor's degree from Stanford University. Oh, and he has a handout. Yeah, I have a handout. So I think there should be plenty of handouts. So good morning. Um, I apologize I, I wasn't able to come here yesterday because at Davis we're still teaching. Uh, we're on the uh, quarter system, so glad I made it today. So my, um, my paper is based on a section in my, uh, in my dissertation uh, on the author called Lu Xun. And if you, a if you were to ask a Chinese scholar um, who the most important writer is in the 20th century in China, uh, it wouldn't be Mo Yan, who just who recently won the Nobel Prize in Literature in 2012. It wouldn't be Gao Xingjian, who won in 2000. And it wouldn't be Eileen Chang, uh, who used to teach at Berkeley in the 60s. It would be Lu Xun. Um, here's a photo of him in, in 1930. And if you were to look, um, look at you know, history, Chinese literary history, you would find sentences such as, you know, he was the founding father of modern Chinese literature, or as Chinese, the Chinese-American uh, writer Ha Jin puts it, his stories will be read as long as the Chinese language exists. So hopefully that gives you a little context about why I'm picking this particular writer. Um, but I'm going to start in a... Uh, rather obliquely, so instead of starting with Lu Xun, I'm going to actually talk about Carl Hagenbach's circus in Shanghai in 1933. So just to give everyone a, a little context, I'm going to show you a little clip of what the circus is like. One more clip. So hopefully everyone has a sense of the materials I'm going to start with today. So on October 30th, 1933, Lu Xun published a column titled How to Train Wild Animals for the Shanghai newspaper Shen Bao. The article comments on the arrival of Karl Hagenbeck's circus in Shanghai and a recent lecture of the same title given by Richard Sawada, a manager of the circus. Sawada is quoted as saying, quote, some may think that wild animals can be handled by force or by the fist, but to oppress them is a mistake, for, it, for this is the way in which primitives used to do things, and today's training methods are altogether different. The method we use now is the power of love, with which we can gain their trust in humans, for only the power of love and a gentle disposition will move them. Andrew Jones, author of Developmental Fairy Tales, Evolutionary Thinking and Modern Chinese Culture, interprets Lu Xun as reluctantly agreeing with Sawada. For Jones, quote, animal training stands in for the process by which the backward are made forward, benighted nations are enlightened, and colonial subjects are trained for modern life, unquote. Dancing elephants, bicycle riding monkeys, and ball tossing seals become stand-ins in his analysis. These unique and discreet sentient beings held in captive servitude 
are at risk of being sublated in the lofty and abstract figure of the animal, the animal with a capital A, a type of lanimo to invoke a Derridian term. What I take、uh, issue with is not so much Jones's analysis of the semi-colonial situation in Republican China in the 1930s, but his representation of the human-on-human relationship in Lu Xun's works. While I do not deny that Lu Xun, as an author, employs animals allegorically to enable discussions on other levels, I do want to call attention to his actual interaction, interactions with actual non-humans, which he frequently alludes to or describes in his writings. It is in it is in these texts that Lu Xun that we can see Lu Xun mourning the deaths of non-humans. Rabbits and Cats is a 1922 short story about a boy's interaction with non-humans. In the title, the, the narrator is assumed to be the boy who is now recounting the events as, as an adult. The story begins with the children welcoming two little rabbits into the household. The rabbits are so young that their ears are still red. They like to eat wallpaper, gnaw at the legs of wooden furniture, eat fallen mulberries, and chase after crows and magpies. After reaching maturity, the the rabbits move to a hole that they have dug in the ground, where the mother gives birth to two little rabbits. Then all of a sudden, the rabbits disappear. The madam of the household investigates and finds only newborns. The older siblings have apparently died of unknown causes. The narrator offers several modes of relating to the rabbits in the following paragraph. This pair of white rabbits seems to have left their mother. Not not long ago, even though they are an alien species, one can see that they are innocent and unaffected. Their little long red ears prop up, their noses move, their eyes express a sense of surprise and bewilderment. I suppose they feel feel ill at ease, unfamiliar with the people and place, unlike when they're back home. This type of thing, if you buy it yourself at a temple fair, costs at most two strings of coins each. Yet, third madam, spend a whole dollar. Because she asked the servant to buy them at a store. The rabbits are variously compared to aliens, humans, and objects. He first calls them an alien species, then innocent and unaffected like little children, strangers missing their old homes, and finally things, commodities to be bought and sold. Even though the non-humans are companion animals, humans are not in complete control of the non-humans. When the rabbits are first brought home, Third Madam trains the family dog not to attack them. However, a big black cat lurks in the area, threatening to hurt the rabbits. The predator-prey relationship exists among companion animals, despite the presence of humans. In addition to avoiding predators, the little rabbits have to fight one another for the mother's milk. It is implied that the two oldest rabbits had to beat out the rest of the litter to survive. Even non-humans that are considered predators in the story fight amongst themselves. The narrator describes how the family dog would protect the rabbits against the black cat. The narrator of rabbits and cats complicates the standard association of Lu Xun's works with evolutionary thinking. The narrator is not interested in the mere survival of non-humans, but rather contemplates and mourns their deaths. He laments that history. The history of living things does not record the deaths of organisms. He remembers seeing pigeon feathers under under a Chinese scholar tree, and suspecting that an eagle took it as prey. He call he recalls seeing a small dog being run over by a carriage, and finding no traces of the accident when he returns to the same spot a few moments later. When he hears flies buzzing at night, he imagines them to be caught by spiders. He wonders, quote. Who is there to know that a life was once extinguished here?、Unquote. Nothing remains of these non-humans, not even their bones, feathers, shells. What the narrator diagnoses is the anxiety that not even the material evidence of death may remain. The text, however, bears the trace of Lu Xun's actual interactions with actual non-humans. At the end of the story, the boy announces his plan to poison the black cat to ensure the security of the rabbits once and for all. The gruesome conclusion spurred accusations that Lu Xun abused cats, which he actually did. In his 1926 essay "Dogs, Cats, and Mice," Lu Xun gives an autobiographical reason for his prejudice against feline beings. When he was around 10, he found companionship in small mice that lived in his house. Although they were not pets, he found them adorable, 
Not only did he protect them from predators, he also fed them. One day, the mice suddenly disappeared, leaving the young Lu Xun waiting in vain. A servant told him that they were nowhere to be found because the cat ate them. Ever since then, the young Lu Xun developed a hatred for cats. He wrote at the time, quote, "When I lose that which I love and my heart is left with emptiness, I must fill it with a malicious thought of revenge." Unquote. Even though he found out several months later that it was his mother who killed them, the seeds of hatred had been sown. Rabbits and cats can therefore be read in an autobiographical context. What I'm interested in, however, is not the correspondence between the story and the author's personal history. I'm interested in how these non-humans actually existed once before, lived as actual beings that came face to face with Lu Xun. Animals qua animals, not animals as smear symbols in the cage of human discourse. In this way, Lu Xun's writings function as what Adorno calls the planet. Plenipotentiary of fuse of what is not merely for the subject, and non-humans are not merely for the human subject. Like Lu Xun, Adorno also tells a story about rabbits in Minima Moralia. So I'm going to end with、uh, two quotations here. As long as I have been able to think, I have derived happiness from the song between the mountain and the deep, deep vale. About the two rabbits who, regaling themselves on the grass, were shot down by the hunter. And on realizing they were still alive, made off in haste. What would happiness be that was not measured by the immeasurable grief at what is? Imagine Lu Xun's poignant reply to Adorno: "What? Is, who is there to know that a life was once extinguished here?" <laughs>